All right, guys, we've got everybody coming in here real quick. I've got Hunt here. Um, Time-wise, we are right at noon central time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy day uh, to watch this. I think there's something uh, for everyone in here, even though it's, it's the basic um, introduction to numbers, but uh, I imagine you're going to come out of this um, with something new. If you don't know me or are not familiar with me, my name is Chris Cotton with AutoFix Auto Shop Coaching. And of course, we have Hunt Demarest with Parmelis, um, who's going to do the bulk of the speaking today. So I'm going to step back, let Hunt take over, and I'm going to make sure that everybody's muted, help with chat during the stuff uh, or during the meeting, and then go from there. And if you'll just, if everybody will stay muted until the end, um, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to answer questions and stuff like that. But if you want to go ahead and put it in the chat, then that's kind of how we'll answer the questions at the end and do it that way. Um, we had almost 200 people sign up for this. It looks like we're, um, people are coming in pretty steady right now. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Hunt and let him get started. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on here. And yeah, like what Chris said, uh, you know, thanks everyone for joining me. I know this is exactly what everyone wants to talk about, financials, um, how to read them, what we should be doing with them. And so, yeah, we're just going to kind of take a dive into this. You know, like Chris says, we're not going to get into something super in-depth today. What I want to do is kind of go through the basic outline of what, you know, shop financials mean to me, and then kind of give you an example of what I do when I look through financials. You know, when I look through someone and I say, hey, where are the problem issues? What's going on? Where are things going right? Where are things going wrong? Kind of get you into my brain and see how I work through some of those things. So let me share my screen over here. So we're going to share that. Hopefully we can see that. Perfect. And so the basic overview of shop financials is we have three different pieces and we're going to see essentially three different reports that we're going to run. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to answer these three questions and usually in this order. First one is how much money did we make, right? Do we make money? Do we lose money? The second one is how much money do we have? All right, we made a profit. How much money do I have in my bank account or in my liabilities or in my accounts payable? You know, what does that look like? And then the third one is where did that money go or where did it come from? You know, because a lot of times if you look at this and you say, well, my financials say this or Hunt told me I made $50,000, but I only have $20,000 in my bank account, then I need to figure out where that money went if it's not in my bank account. And when we're looking at this stuff, I'm going to kind of give you a cheat sheet and the order that we're going to go on this. In order to answer the question, how much money do we make? That's what we're going to be using a profit or loss for, right? The income statement, um, seeing where things are going right, seeing what we had in sales, cost of goods sold, expenses, figuring out what our bottom line is or our loss. Next thing is, you know, how much money do we have? And we're going to be using the balance sheet for that. So the balance sheet is gonna give us a snapshot, depending on what day it is, whether it's today, whether it's the end of the year, whether it's the end of the month, that's gonna give us a snapshot of where we stand for that day. And then the last one is you know, arguably one of the more important things, where did the money go if we made money or where did the money come from in order to fund a loss if we did have a loss? And on that one, we're gonna be using a statement of cash flow. Hopefully you guys can read my chicken scratch there. And so on the statement of cash flow, what we're going to be looking at is we're actually not going to be using the statement of cash flows out of QuickBooks. Um, the statement of cash flows out of QuickBooks is kind of cumbersome. It's not very useful. What we're trying to do here with all of these reports is we're trying to simplify this stuff. We're trying to make it easy to read and we're trying to make it useful for us. Um, all too often I see people, you know, and I look at their financials and they say, Hunt, I just don't understand this because it's either not set up correctly or they're not looking at the right reports. And I agree, you know, I look at this stuff all day, every day. So I can look at some pretty messed up financials, but for people that aren't very comfortable with their financials, you can't do that. We got to make sure that we're getting this stuff set up correctly and set up in a manner that it makes sense for you and you're able to use as a useful tool. So let's get into this. I'm going to undo this, get rid of all of this. 
that's going to take forever. Let me just erase it here. So first thing we need to do is we are going to figure out how much money do we make. And if you remember, we're going to be using the profit or loss statement to figure that out. But the first thing that I want to do is I want to give you the general overview of a profit or loss or P&L and what it should look like. So the basic profit and loss statement is made up of a couple parts here. So easy enough, we got sales. Sales are on our top line. Next thing we have is cost of goods sold. And so for this example, my cost of goods sold is going to include tech labor, obviously parts, and then also service advisor. Okay, this is just for my exercise. I know that there's some people out there that look at this a little bit differently. I know there's some people that look at service advisors, not a cost of goods sold, but they look as an expense. But for this example, and the way that I usually like to look at it, I'm going to put the tech labor up in cost of goods sold off also the service advisor. And when I'm looking at the cost of tech labor and the cost of service advisor, when I'm talking about this, and in the example that I show, those are going to be loaded amounts, which means that it's not just going to be the tech wages in there, it's also going to be the insurance, payroll taxes, um, you know, anything else that goes along with the benefits for the employees. Um, I see a question on there. Sublet should be in there. Exactly right. So there's other stuff going to be in here. Sublet cost of goods sold, shop supplies. Anything that you're directly selling to a customer is going to be included in cost of goods sold. All right. So if we got the cost of goods sold, if we take the sales less cost of goods sold, we get gross profit. And then when we go down a little bit further here, after our gross profit, we use those gross profit dollars to pay for our expenses. And then hopefully we got money left over here at the end. And that is our profit or in a bad case, that is our loss. And so when I'm looking at this and I have this general overview here, the formula that I'm looking for is the following. And so when I look at stuff, I always look at stuff as percentages because percentages work whether you have a shop that's doing $20,000 a month or 250,000. It, you know, it transfers to no matter what the size, it's scalable. And so when I'm looking at the financials, the first baseline I do is kind of run it on a spread of what I'm expecting to see. So the general automotive shop, your gross profit percentage should be around 50%. And so if your gross profit percentage is 50%, then we are gonna allocate another 30% for expenses. And so if we have the sales come in, we got less the cost of goods sold, it's gonna leave us 50% of that money left over. We then spend 30% of our sales on expenses, which should leave us 20% net income, right? And so if we have a million dollar a year shop, we got a million dollars coming in, we're gonna have $500,000 of gross profit, $300,000 of fixed expenses, which is gonna leave us $200,000 in profit. That is the perfect scenario, right? That is what we're shooting for here. Now, I'm not gonna go out and tell you that every single shop is gonna fit in this same mold. This is a general guideline. When we talk about all this stuff, we talk about all these numbers, people think that this is black and white. Well, hey, if I'm at 49%, then that's not good for my business. And that's just not the case. Every business is a little bit different and every business you know, has strength and has weaknesses. Depending on what kind of stuff you're doing, you're gonna have some different targets. Um, you know, if we just look at something as simple as parts gross profit margin, if you're doing diesel work or if you're doing the Euro market, you're probably not going to be able to get as good of a margin as someone that's doing general repair. It's just the nature of the beast and that's what the industry is going to allow. But these percentages kind of allow me to be able to take a look at this and figure out where things are going right or where things are going wrong and where we should start on it. And so let's kind of go down through here with an example. And so the example that I'm going to do here is actually a real shop's number. And so I was talking with the shop earlier last year, um, having some issues with the financials, just didn't understand it, just need some help getting this, these financials cleaned up. And I said, you know what, this is perfect. And I asked them if I said, hey, you know what, can I use all your numbers and pull this into an exercise? Because I think this might be something that will resonate with a lot of people. And so what I'm going to show you is what the financials look like before we did anything, before we cleaned anything up. And you can probably agree that, hey, you know what, this is how mine either look like right now, or this is how mine used to look. And so this is what the financials look like before I did anything. And so let's just kind of go down through a couple areas here. 
And so if you remember before, what we're looking for here is we're looking for 50% gross profit. You can see down here, we don't have any percentages set up, but this is at about 48% gross profit. That's not too bad. And now if we go down here to our fixed expenses, you will see that we almost have the same exact amount down here in expenses. We're at like 40, let's see, we're at 58%. We're actually down here over 50%. We're at like 55% netting or 55% fixed expenses, right? We got, we got a ton of overhead here. We're not making any money. And if you go down here to the bottom, you will actually see that that is exactly the case and he's not making any money here. So there's a little negative here, but this is actually a $43,000 loss. So we're looking at it. Gross profit looks all right. Overhead looks really high. We're not making any money. But then we're looking at this and I say, wait, hang on a second. What the heck is this? We got this monstrous account called Ask My Accountant that now flips us from a $43,000 loss to a $24,000 net income. Now, if you're looking at these financials, you're probably just as confused as I am. Are you making money? Are you not making money? We don't even know what's going on here. And so if we go down here and we kind of take a look into this a little bit better, we start seeing that we got some really weird stuff going on. And so we have cost of goods sold up here, but I don't know what that is. It's just, two, it's $256,000. Is that gonna be parts? Is that our technician? Is our service advisor in there? What is encompassing that amount? We don't know. Um, if you go down here, we got some office expenses. We got shop floor group. Um, we got payroll expenses down here. You know, there's just a lot of things in here where I'm looking at this. I'm saying we have too many variables here. I can start guessing on what's going on with this business. Usually just because I look at enough of these, I can kind of usually figure out what's going on. But even this one just kind of left me stumped and I didn't even know where to start. Anyone that is using these financials right now and tried to make a decision off of it, you're just using a best guess. There's no way that you could fully understand what's going on with this business and what you need to do to change it given the current setup that's going on. And so if these are your financials and what I have people that kind of go down through this is they're saying, all right, these are my financials. This is as good as I understand. This is as good as I have it set up. I'm going to look at this. You know what? I don't get the information that I need. Let me go one step further and actually expand these financials. And so this is all out of QuickBooks. This is all collapsed. And now we go over here and these are the expanded financials. Once we expand these financials, you will see that actually all the information is in here. And so instead of having that one big sales total, we actually have all the categories split out here. You can see we got labor sales. You can see we got part sales. You can see we got shop supplies and sublet sales. You can see that that big contra group that we have is actually our discounts. And so there's a lot of stuff in here. All the information is in here. We just don't have this set up correctly to allow us to analyze this. And so if we go down here to our cost of goods sold, again, when we expand this stuff, we have mechanical labor, we have cost of parts, we have cost of shop supplies, all of the stuff is in here. It's just kind of buried, it's kind of, you know, put in sporadic spots, and it's just not set up in an effective way to be able to analyze here. And so the general idea here is if you go down through this expanded profit and loss, all of the stuff that we need is in here. And this is something that I see so much with people's finances is it's not that your financials are way out of whack or they're completely different or they're even wrong. All the information in there, it just needs to be cleaned up. It just needs to be set up in a more condensed and streamlined manner. And so if you look at this, this is three pages. We're still scrolling down through this. There is a ton of information in here. Right, we got payroll expenses. We still have some wages that aren't split out here. We still have the ask my account that we have no idea about. But the general idea is that we have too much information here. This is no way to look at financials. If you're looking for one specific thing, then great. Hey, how much did I spend on electric? Boom, there it is, $6,000, we got that. But for a high level view to be able to run those numbers and kind of get an idea of where we stand or where things are going right or where things are going wrong, there's just no way we can do this in this format. And so what I did here was I cleaned this up. And so 
I did not make any entries. I did not move stuff around. I did not adjust stuff. All I did here was I simply just kind of cleaned up the chart of accounts. All of these items in sales were all sub accounts before. I just made them, you know, regular main accounts. Anything that we are tracking in sales, I made sure that we had a corresponding cost of goods sold account. You can see down below here in our fixed expenses, we got everything streamlined. We put some better detail on some of this stuff. We split out officer payroll. We just kind of got into a format where we can really look and see what's going on. Now you can see I did, you know, I did cheat a little bit there. I did actually have to clean up that ask my accountant, but you can see once I cleaned up that ask my accountant, we didn't make $24,000. We lost $41,000. And so right off the bat there, there's a monstrous thing. If we would have gone off our profit and loss statement that we had before there, it looked weird. It looked out of whack, but it actually showed that we were making money. When in reality, this was completely wrong. And we actually lost $40,000 on the year. And so let's kind of dive into this, right? The first thing that we want to talk about is, did we make money? So right off the bat, we know that we lost money, right? So we know we need to look at these financials. I know a lot of people are guilty of this is they say, hey, you know what? I made money. We're done here. I don't need to do anything else. Things are going fine. I'm making money. I'm profitable. Why do I need to look at my financials? Um, a, everyone should be looking at their financials. And also B, everyone has places they can improve. You know, some people have a huge ceiling on where they can improve based on where they are. Some people have a really good business, but they can probably inch up a couple other places. This person, you know, if I'm looking at this, and, you know, untrained eye is going to say, hey, this business is completely gone. This can, business is completely dead. We're doing a ton of sales here, right? We did half a million dollars in sales and we lost 10% of that. You know, that's terrible. But what we're going to kind of dive into here is when you're looking at this, it's really not as bad as it looks. It's really not something that you're going to have to overanalyze most anything on here other than a couple key areas. And so let's kind of go back to what I was talking about before to do a preliminary look at this. And so if you remember, we're supposed to be at 20% net income. Obviously, we are not there right now. We're at 8% loss. So right off the bat, we know that something's wrong. So let's work our way up. So if you can see here, we're at 46% fixed expenses, meaning that 46% of our sales are going to our fixed expenses. If you remember on my exercise before, fixed expenses should be about 30% of sales. And so what I'm gonna do here is kind of quickly talk about fixed expenses and what we need to do for fixed expenses. So fixed expenses for an automotive repair shop are pretty much, they are what they are. There's really not a whole lot that you're gonna be able to do to change these things. If you go down through and look at what we're really spending a, a decent amount of our money on, there's only a handful of things. We got advertising, right? Advertising is almost 2%. We got credit card fees. We got office expense. We got officer payroll. We got pay and benefit groups. And then we have our rent. And then the, maybe the last one here we'll talk about is the shop floor expense. So let's take a look at this because I see people all the time. And so if you're looking at this and you're saying, hey, Hunt, we spent 46% of our expenses on overhead where we should have been 30%. The first thing that comes to most people's mind is I need to start cutting the expenses. I've never seen anyone be able to save their way into a profit. Sure, you can tighten up, you can cut back on a couple places, but you're not going to be able to sudden have a business that's not making any money to a business that's what you really want and super profitable just by cutting the expenses. It just never happens. And I'll kind of prove to you why. And so let's kind of go down through here and look at these things and see how there's probably no way or it'd actually be detrimental to start cutting these expenses. And so I'm not worried about some of this stuff that is very small, right? $404 for corporate expense. We're not even going to talk about that. Let's look at expenses, though. Let's look at advertising. So we're spending about $8,000 on advertising for 11-month period. Right? $8,000 is a decent amount of money, but it's also pretty cheap as far as advertising goes. If I start cutting those expenses, what's going to happen to me on the back end? Right? I'm trying to get cheap. I'm trying to get lean here. I'm trying to be profitable. I start cutting my advertising. Hey, in the short term, sure, I'm saving money. I'm not paying my advertisers, but what's that going to do to car count? Is car count going to dry up and actually magnet magnify this problem? So we're not going to do that. Bank and merchant credit card fees, $8,000. That's your credit card fees. 
what are you going to do there, right? This is the day that we live in. This is the world we live in. Now, I know that there's some people out there that say, well, you can do one of these new ones where they actually charge the customer for it. Sure. You know, but other than that, your credit card fees are what they are. It's just a cost of doing business. So that one's out the door. Office expenses. Office expenses is usually a catch-all group, and I'll be honest, right? That's is probably somewhere where a lot of my clients just bury some stuff, whether it's business or personal. But this is all stuff that we're buying. Whether you decide to take the deduction and deduct it on your taxes or not, office supplies are just kind of something that are there. There's probably not a whole lot of money in there that just doesn't need to get spent. Um, and so you could go down through it and say, hey, we're spending $20,000. Maybe we can knock that down to $15,000. All right, that's great. It's five thousand dollars, but still, that will take us from a forty thousand dollar loss to a thirty-five thousand dollar loss. It doesn't completely change the landscape. Next one on here is officer payroll. So, officer payroll. This guy's taking a pretty healthy salary out of here, eighty-four thousand um, dollars. You could argue the fact that hey, maybe the reason that there's a loss is he's taking too much money on the business in a form of payroll which I get you, I agree with that. Hey, maybe it's a little bit too much for last year, but we don't know the situation. We don't know what he has going on. We don't know what he needs to live off of. At the end of the day, $84,000 is not a ton of money for someone to make. You know, you think about this in this aspect of, you know, most of you here are probably shop owners. Think about if someone was to come to you and say, hey, you can come run my shop. You can be the owner of the shop and I'm going to pay you $84,000 a year. You don't get anything else over and above that. I would probably argue that most of you guys would probably not take that job and say, you know what, $84,000 is not even enough for me to take that job, you know, let alone, you know, foot all the liabilities and stuff that go along with it. And so officer payroll is something where it's like, hey, you know what, it is a major expense, but it's also money going into our own pocket. So not a whole lot we can do there. Pay and benefit groups. Now, this is going to be, you know, this is a little bit different because we have some stuff loaded, some stuff down in fixed expenses, but this is going to be employee benefits, right? Maybe it's meetings, maybe it's training, maybe it's health insurance, maybe it's a retirement account. You start cutting into that, what that's, what is that going to do? What kind of message is that going to send to your team? Hey, you know what, guys, you know, the first place that I'm going to cut here is instead of providing health insurance, we're not going to cover health insurance. Do you think that that's going to take care of your team? Do you think that that's going to make them stay with you longer? Do you think that's going to make them work harder? No, it's going to probably have the exact opposite effect. Hey, we saved $10,000 on our you know, employee benefits, but how much are we going to lose in productivity? And God forbid, are we going to lose one of our team members because of it? So that's out the window. Um, rent or lease of a building, right? If you have a landlord, you can go to them and you can say, hey, can I decrease my rent? And they're probably going to say no, right? There's nothing we can do on that. It is what it is. And then the last one, shop floor group. So shop floor group in this situation, this is tools. This is different stuff that the shop makes to, you know, make sure that our guys are, you know, have the proper equipment, have the proper supplies and are able to do their job effectively. You start cutting into that stuff. You're going to start cutting into your top line. You're going to start cutting into productivity. You're going to start cutting into sales. General overview here that I want to talk about with his expenses is any time that I look at this and I see that we have a fixed expense issue, meaning our expense, our overhead is too high, I don't ever look at usually, well, I shouldn't say don't ever. The first place I don't look is cutting expenses. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to drive our sales and drive our gross profit so that these fixed expenses become relatively less expensive. And when we go through this next exercise in the gross profit and we run through this whole thing, you'll kind of see what I mean. And so at the end of the day, a shop is really made or broken by two things, parts and labor. Parts and labor. If you do parts and labor well, if you have a good gross profit margin on parts and labor, you can pretty much screw up just about everything else and you'll still have a very good business. On the flip side of things, if you don't do parts and labor well, you could have really cheap overhead, you could have all the other stars aligned, and you're still not going to have a very good business. You might be able to get by, but these are pretty much the two key categories. Once you have hammered these, then you can move on to something else, but these are always the first place that I start. And so if we look at this, our gross profit is 37%. And so I know that we have a gross profit issue. 
And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to analyze that gross profit and, and see how we can increase that closer to the 50% mark. I'm not going to tell you how to get some of these numbers. I'm not going to tell you how to increase the gross profit, um, you know, how to do parts matrix. That's what Chris is for. What I'm trying to show you is how to analyze where the issue is. And probably a lot of times of what Chris also does going down through here and taking a look and seeing what really the pain point is for a shop. So first thing I'm going to do is let's take a look at parts. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to run our gross profit percentage. And if you remember before, what that's going to be is we're going to have part sales plus parts cost. Zoom doesn't write very well, does it? And that's going to give us parts gross profit. If I then divide that gross profit by the sales, that's going to come up with a percentage. OK. And so if I have $238,000 in part sales, I have $150,000 in parts cost. I do the math on that, and that comes out. We're making 37% gross profit on parts. 37% gross profit. Not a terrible gross profit percentage for parts, but it's not great. So 37% is probably on the bottom of what is acceptable. You probably have to dive into and see what kind of stuff this guy's doing. General rule of thumb for most people, 50% gross profit. 50% gross profit for parts is a very realistic target for most shops. And so that's kind of just on the surface here. One thing that we still haven't analyzed is we have this here, our discounts. And so that discount is $55,000. 15,000 of that is going to be our parts discounts and the remaining $40,000 is going to be our labor discounts. So remember, we're already kind of on the, you know, iffy side of if we're making money or making enough money on parts. Once I factor that discount in, we're not making 37%, we're now making 33% on parts. Right? That's getting even worse. And so this is, you know, I shouldn't say that this is the easier, but if we're talking about parts and labor, the fixing the parts gross profit margin is actually the easy part, right? Parts is pretty simple. We have a matrix we set up in our shop management software. We put in the cost of the part, the matrix works and it spits out a price and that's what it goes to the customer. The biggest issue, and we'll kind of let Chris chime in on the end of this here, that I see for shops is they have a decent matrix. It looks fine, the percentages look okay, but they're not sticking to the matrix. Now, if you are sticking dead onto the matrix and these are the kind of results that you're getting, then hey, maybe you need to go and reanalyze your parts matrix. Maybe you need to go and tweak some categories so you can drive this closer and closer to 50%. But parts are very simple, right? There's no people involved. Let the computer do it. We bought a part for a certain amount. We're gonna mark it up. We're gonna sell for something else. And we're gonna be driving this as close as we can to 50%. I have some people that do 60%. I have some people that do 65% for parts. It's not common. It's not something that will work for every business. That's why for this exercise, we're gonna shoot for 50%. So that's a part side of things, you know, right? We have two issues going on in gross profit, parts and labor. Parts, we've more or less solved right there, right? We need to drive our gross profit on parts. We need to make sure that we're sticking to our matrix and getting closer and closer to 50%. Now, Let's go over to the labor side of things. The labor side of things is always a little bit trickier because anytime we're talking about labor, we're talking about humans, right? And anytime we're talking about humans, that gets complicated. We got to figure out, you know, what incentivizes people. We got to figure out what makes people click. We got to figure out what people are doing. Some person works like this, other people works like that. Labor is a very tricky one, but it's probably one of the biggest issues that I see for shops. And so just like before here, uh, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at the gross profit to see if we have an issue with labor. And so if I take $287,000 in sales, $114,000 in cost, we will see that we have 60% gross profit for labor. 60% gross profit for labor on a loaded aspect is actually pretty darn good. But if you remember before, we need to factor in these discounts. So once we factor in these discounts, I'm actually not making 60% gross profit. I'm actually making 54% gross profit. So 
54% gross profit isn't hateful, right? Even go back to the parts. I mean, that's not like we're making single digit gross profit. We're making money on this stuff. We're marking this stuff up. We're just a little bit short. You know, we need to see that exceed over 60%, pretty much as high as we can get on it. Um, you know, as far as looking at a loaded cost, 70%, maybe 75% is the max that I could ever see. And that is very rare. Mid 60%, we're probably doing pretty well. But labor is made up of a couple of different aspects. Remember, we talked about there's humans involved here. And so what I want to do here when I dive into labor is I want to figure out why our gross profit is not where it needs to be and what we need to do to fix it. So the first thing that I do when I look at labor gross profit is I want to figure out what your labor rate is. So I talked to this guy and I said, what's your labor rate? He says $110. If you notice, this is the first part of this exercise where I had to go and get information that was not on QuickBooks. Everything else that I was able to do, I was able to do just running the numbers, just looking at the numbers. And so I talked to him, his labor rate, oh, well, I got popped up on here. Um, his labor rate is $110 an hour. And so $110 an hour isn't too bad, right? But the first thing that I always ask someone is, all right, you're at $110 an hour, how long has it been at 110? Some people like to wear this like a badge of honor and they'll say, "Hunt, it's 110, it's been like that for five years, I just stuck to it. We need to be increasing our labor rate at least 3% every single year just to keep up with inflation. If you look at parts, we never have to do this for parts because parts were, baked, were marking up based on costs. Labor is just a set target. It's book time times our street rate and that's what we're gonna sell it for. It will never increase unless you manually go and increase that. Um, but in his situation, $110, um, he does increase it over the years, and it seems to be pretty decent for where he is. And so we're actually not going to be making any sort of price increase on the labor side of things. And so we got two different aspects on, on the labor gross profit side. We have the pricing side of it, and then we have the productivity side. Most people have this number down pretty good. You know, whether 110 is good for your area, whether 165 is good for your area, people are getting better and better about charging what they are really worth. Hey, you know what? We're just not going to do this for 70 bucks an hour. We need to get paid for it. But what people don't talk about very much is the productivity side of it. So if we look at the productivity side of it, I say, all right, we're charging $110 an hour. How productive are we being? And so what we're going to do here is I have to go and ask him another question. And so what I asked him here is I said, what is, how many technicians do you have? Okay, all screwed up here. So we have two and a half technicians. And so what we ended up having here was January through June, he had three technicians, then June through November at the end of the year, he lost one of his technicians, which is down to two. And so what I want to see here is I want to see for this 11 month period, how many hours were our technicians in the shop. And so if the standard year is 2080 hours in a year, and I'm going down through this and I'm looking at it, simple math, we have about 5200 hours where techs were there. I'm actually going to flip over here to this whiteboard so we can do it over there. Clear this. Erase all that. And hopefully you guys will be able to see this a little bit better. All right. So we had two and a half technicians. They were there for 5,200 hours. That's based on 40 hours a week, five days a week. You physically had employees there for 5,200 hours for this 11 month period. And then what I need to do is I need to figure out how many labor hours that I sold. And in order to do that, all I want to do here is I want to take my labor sales, $287,000, and I divide it by 110. And so if I take 2000 and, or if I take $287,000 in sales, I divide it by 110 hours, I come out that I sold 2,609 hours. So my guys were there for 5,200 hours. They sold half of those. But again, like we talked about before, it's really not 2,609 because we discounted this. 
And so we actually only sold 2,245. So essentially, if you think about this on an eight hour day, we're at 43% efficiency here or productivity. I'm kind of using the two terms interchangeably here, but we're at 43%, meaning in an eight hour day, the person on average is billing out about three and a half hours. Is there for eight hours, you're getting paid for three and a half. That's not very good, right? So what the general rule of thumb to shoot for for paid productivity on the very baseline is going to be 75%. Again, I have people that go way above that. I have some people that run at 100, 115% efficiency. Guys that are there for 40 hours a week and they bill out 50 hours. It's not unheard of. But essentially what we're trying to shoot here in the very baseline is saying, hey, if you're there for eight hours a day, I want you to be getting paid for six. If you're there for 40 hours in a week, I want you to get paid for 30. There is not a person on this planet that could come back and say, boss, I just can't do 30 hours in a week. 30 hours in a week, if you're there for 40, gives you 10 hours to go to the snap-on truck, um, you know, to do digital inspections, to do test drives, to clean stuff up. It's not, we're not shooting for 100% right here. While I would love it, and we have some people that do that, 75% productivity is a very good baseline to go for. And it's realistic. And you can see here that that is the biggest problem with this business. We're at 43%. We need to be at 75%. And this is kind of the crux of most of our issues here. The reason that I love productivity is productivity is a win-win-win for everyone, right? Because when you run an auto repair shop, you're really dealing with three different parties. You're dealing with yourself as the owner. You're dealing with your customers. And you're dealing with your employees, your technicians. And so productivity increases make everyone happy. The customer is going to be happy because they're not getting charged any more money. We're not increase, increasing the labor rate. We're not increasing the labor matrix. We're just being more productive and we're getting stuff done. And we're getting done, stuff done on time. So customers are happy because you guys are hitting deadlines. You're getting work out the door. Your technician is happy because hopefully there's some way that they're incentivized on getting paid by production, whether it's flat rate, team bonus structure, whatever it may be. If they're doing more work, they should be getting paid more money. And then finally, you're happy because obviously, if you're selling you know, 75% of the amount of time that people are there versus 50%, you're making more money. Productivity is probably the biggest thing that people don't understand or don't analyze. It's probably one of the biggest underlying issues that I see with shops. Productivity is one thing that is a killer because if you don't, if you aren't productive, just like we talked about everything before, it's not going to make any sense and you're just not going to hit the numbers that you need to. And so the last thing that I will do on the productivity side is I want to kind of give you an example here to hammer this home one more time. So let's say here that your labor rate is $100. Okay. Decent labor rate, you know, probably a little bit on the lower side of what the average is for the country. Um, you have a really good A technician and you pay him $30 an hour flat rate. You're looking at these two things and you're saying, how the heck am I not making any money here? I got a guy that I'm paying $30 an hour. I'm selling him for $100 an hour and I'm not making any money. But this is assuming that we have 100% efficiency. And this is also ignoring any of our loaded costs. So the first thing that we need to do here is we need to say, you know what? This isn't really costing me $30 an hour for this technician. This is really costing me like $40 an hour once I factor in taxes, insurance, benefits, and everything else. And so you can see right off the bat here, we're getting worse and worse. And now let's go down and use this as an example of what we're talking about with this shop here. If we're at 50% efficiency, that means for every hour that I bill out to a customer, it's not costing me $40 an hour for that technician. It's really costing me $80 an hour. Because if they're at 50% efficiency, it means for every hour that they are billing out, you're paying them for two hours of their time. And so it's not always one for one. I know that the flat rate argument comes in here. Just for this example, I'm just kind of giving you an idea on how this efficiency kind of drives into this. And so before you saw that it was looking like we were making, you know, $70 gross profit on an hour sold, when we factor in the productivity or the lack thereof, plus the, ben the benefits, you know, to go along with paying this technician, we're not making $70 gross profit. We're making $20 gross profit on every hour sold. You can see how quickly this business is just kind of gets eaten up with these productivity.
So just something to keep in mind there, something that hopefully you guys can kind of go down through and do on your shop alone. Um, I think I saw someone asked there about effective labor rate. Um, when I'm doing this exercise, you can get the amount of hours sold out of your shop management software. A lot of times I'm just doing it quickly off these numbers because what I'm looking for is I'm saying, hey, I don't really care what my effective rate is for this situation. I want to get paid $110 an hour. That's what I've decided to set my rate at. How many hours did I get paid at 110? Okay, fairly straightforward. You know, if you run the math on your shop management software, you might say, well, hey, Hunt, I really wasn't 48% product productive. I was really more like 51%. At the end of the day, you're going to have an issue no matter how you run these numbers. And we're really kind of looking for the overall idea of what's going on versus the actual absolute numbers here. Now, obviously, if you're comparing periods and you're looking for changes, we want to get the exact numbers. And so the overall idea here with this business is we have a productivity issue and we have a parts gross profit margin issue. And so if I'm going down through and I'm looking at this, I'm saying we really need to make two changes. First change is we need to make our technicians more productive. We're at 50% productivity right now. We're gonna go up to 75% productivity. What that's gonna do here is it's gonna turn a business that's doing $500,000 in sales. And this business is now gonna be doing 750,000. Pretty simple math there, right? If we have 50% productivity, that gives us 500 grand. If we go to 75%, that's gonna give us $750,000. So our labor costs are not gonna really change any. You know, They're gonna go up a little bit because we have to be a little bit more productive. We are also gonna increase our parts gross profit margin, which is gonna hopefully allow us to go to that 50% uh, gross profit target like we talked about. So if we're at 50% gross profit, that would mean that we have $375,000 in gross profit dollars. Remember that $375,000 in gross profit dollars allows us to pay you know, not only the officer's payroll, but every other overhead expense. And so if we go down here, we have $375,000 of gross profit. We have $230,000 in cost, which still leaves us with $140,000 of net income. If you do the math on it, if we have a business that's doing $750,000 in sales, $140,000 is pretty much dead on the 20% that we're shooting for. So this is kind of how we change the business from struggling, not making any money to making 20% exactly what like we're shooting for. If you notice on this, you know, in simple terms, you know, we had an overhead issue. Our overhead was super expensive. Our gross profit was a little bit off, but our overhead was, you know, super expensive. We didn't touch this number. It's still $230,000. But what we did by driving gross profit and driving sales on this, we made that overhead relatively cheaper and still achieve the ultimate bottom goal. So when I'm looking at this and I'm going back and I'm talking to my client, this is overwhelming. We have a ton of stuff going on here. You know, don't look into all of these things. Let's focus on some key areas that we need to fix. You need to fix your labor productivity. You need to fix your parts margin. You do those, you do those well, this business is all going to fall in line. It's going to make sense. Okay. Now I know easier said than done, but that's why Chris makes the big bucks. And that's how he guides people to go down through, fix this stuff, you know, fix your labor, uh, fix your parts matrix, um, you know, how to set up incentive, how to set up pay plans to incentivize your technicians to work more, how to do workflow. You know, a lot of this stuff is the technicians are trying to work as fast as they can or as hard as they can, but the way that you're setting stuff up just doesn't make any sense. And they're not able to be more efficient. So that's the overall idea on this business. And that's kind of how we get from what we see here to what we really need to be doing and what we really need to be driving. So that kind of wraps up on the profit or loss side of it. And so this is going to not only answer what we did was not only answer how much money do we make or lose, but how do we improve that? How do we make that better? If we remember the next piece of hey, this, hey, yep, hon. go for it. Um, before you move on, somebody had a question and they wanted uh -huh. to know why you had the service rider cost in the COGS. Why do I have the service advisor cost in the COGS? And so really we got two reasons for that. So cost of goods sold is, you know, in a literal sense, it's every, it's the cost of selling. 
The service advisor has one job and that's to make sales. If we don't have sales, we don't have a service advisor. And that's why I always argue that service advisors should be in cost of goods sold. The next thing on that is pretty much all of these expenses right here are gonna be variable, right? As our sales go up, these are gonna go along with it and service advisor is the exact same thing. If we're doing half a million dollars, we can probably do it with this much service advisor. If we triple this, you're gonna to have to increase your service advisor costs. Um, you know, I, there's two schools of thoughts on this. Some people look at it as a cost of goods sold. Some people look as a fixed expense. At the end of the day, it doesn't really make a big difference on it. Um, just, you know, it'll kind of throw off some of those percentages that I talked about before. Okay, thanks. And that's, that's all the questions we got now. It's 1245 Central, so you keep going. Um, and, and if anybody else has any questions, go ahead and, and put them in the chat and we'll ask them when we get a break here. Cool. Um, so we, we showed, you know, where, you know, if we're making money, if we're losing money and kind of analyze what's going on with the business and what the pain points are. And so what we need to do now is we need to figure out, all right, how much or how little money do we have? Just like before, we need to be able to have good financials in order to do so. And so this is the balance sheet here. You can take a look at this balance sheet. This is, again, before I cleaned anything up. We've got negative numbers on here. We got two accounts receivable on here. We got stuff that's not changing, right? We got no balance change from the end of last year to November. We just have a lot of stuff that it isn't right. What I did here, just like I did before, is I went down through and I cleaned all this stuff up, got rid of these old accounts and just put it in a very, very condensed format. And so what you'll see here is something that is hopefully a lot easier to read. This is a huge, huge issue here. You are not giving yourself a fair shake at this if you're not setting the financials up correctly. If you don't set the financials up correctly, if you don't get them cleaned up, then it's gonna be very, very hard for you to understand your numbers. You know, I work with people all the time and they say, wow, I've just never really understood my numbers. And I say, well, probably not. If you're looking at stuff like this, where you got negative balances and all that stuff, there's no chance for you to be able to understand this. It doesn't make sense to anyone, it's just not right. So making sure that these numbers are set up correctly allows us to go down the balance sheet and say, all right, you know, after all, everything is said and done, we got $30,000 in the account. You know, I always look at a balance sheet in a comparative format. So this is today's date, or this is the date or the period we are looking at. This is the end of last year, and this is the dollar change. You know, where are we, where were we, and what is the change and where did the money go to get here? And so the balance sheet, you know, the biggest thing that I'm looking at on the balance sheet is most, most shops financials aren't overly complicated on the balance sheet. We're taking a look at cash. How much money do I have? How much money do I have out on the street and accounts receivable? Most people aren't doing a ton of accounts receivable unless you're doing fleet work. The biggest thing that we want to look on that is that this is not majorly growing or majorly decreasing. You know, it should stay about the same, plus or minus a couple thousand dollars. If this number is growing and growing and growing, that either means that something's not getting classified correctly or I have a ton of money out on the street. We all know if you have money on the street, less and less a chance that it's actually gonna come in and convert into cash. Um, on the asset side of things, we're also looking here in this example, parts inventory. Um, most people's parts inventory, this guy doesn't count as parts inventory. Most people don't. Um, again, most people, no matter what you have, what size business you have, whether you have 13,000, whether you have 3,000, they probably keep about the same amount on there, no matter what it is. Um, I recommend counting the inventory. You know, it's kind of personal preference. And if you have the ability to do so, obviously, those of you out there that do tires or something where you're stocking a lot of inventory, you're going to be adjusting that and updating that on a monthly basis. Um, on the asset side of things, really the only other big thing on here is our fixed expenses. Um, we didn't buy any fixed expenses in this example here. Anytime that you bought you know, a new alignment rack, a tire balancer, a new truck, this is where you would see it on fixed expenses. Um, it's actually not going to show up on your income statement, going to show here on the balance sheet because that's going to be something that we're going to depreciate over the life of it. So let's go down here to the liability section. So liability section, I'm looking for a couple of things here. Do we have a whole lot of debt? Um, so we can see accounts payable. So accounts payable, that's gonna be current vendors, right? That's gonna be your NAPA bill. That's gonna be your part suppliers. That's gonna be your utility bills. Hey, are we staying current on all of our stuff? Um, you can see here, we got a little bit of credit card stuff. 
We've got about $30,000 on a credit card, $32,000 last year. Really all in all, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, obviously we'd like to be debt free here, but for some of the, you know, the bloodbath that we were seeing with that loss, that amount of debt is not too much to, it's not insurmountable. We can climb out of that. Um, last thing on this shop's financials here is we got the payroll liabilities and sales tax payable. So payroll liabilities is gonna be whatever you've accrued over the period for payroll taxes, payroll benefits and stuff like that. And then the sales tax is the same exact thing. How much do I owe the state for whatever sales tax I collected? Both of these amounts, again, we're looking at the change. I'm looking to make sure that it's not drastically going up or drastically going down. Um, kind of a quick cheat on this one, payroll liabilities should stay about the same every single month as long as your payroll is staying the same. Towards the end of the year, they're always going to be the highest than they've ever been, right? Because we've got end of year taxes and a lot of stuff that builds up at the end of the year. Sales tax payable goes right along with sales. And so if you have a bunch of consistent sales month, this sales tax amount is going to stay about the same. You know, what would kind of give me a red flag is if either of these were negative or if one of these was massively growing, you know, if we went from $1,000 up to $14,000, then I'm looking at this and saying, hey, something's not right here. If this is going from 1,000 to 14,000 in my sales tax, then either my sales tax payments are not being classified correctly or I'm behind on sales tax. And so looking at the numbers, looking at the change and just trying to get an overall sense of where we are. And then the last section on here is our equity section. So equity section in this example is, is usually made up of three things, retained earnings, distributions, and net income. Um, this year we have an extra one, which is our PPP. So retained earnings is a total of all your earnings over the year, less whatever money you've taken out. And so we have $168,000 in retained earnings, which means that over the years, we've made $168,000 and we've left $168,000 in the business means overall we've been profitable. If you have positive retained earnings or positive equity or positive net worth, you might hear your banks talk about this. It means that you have a history of being a profitable business. If you have negative retained earnings or negative net worth or negative net equity, that means that you have a history of losing money over the life of your business. Obviously, the higher, the better, the more positive, the better. Um, partner distribution here. Um, shareholder distribution, shareholder draws. This is uh, business owner taking money out. Um, this example, he's an S corporation. So once you pay yourself a fair and reasonable salary, you're free to take anything else over and above that out in the form of distributions. Um, and then obviously net income we talked about before, that number is right off of the profit or loss statement and kind of you know flows in here and kind of shows us you know where things are for that specific time period. Um, last one on here is going to be the PPP money. We got $65,000. The reason it's in the equity section is because it's not a loan, right? All that money was forgiven. And with those new tax law changes, it's no longer taxable income to us. So it's kind of stuck in no man's land. And that's why we've been classifying it down here in an equity. So it doesn't really mess up anything on the liability side or net income side of things. So the last thing that I want to show here before I open this up for questions here is I want to show you the cash flow, right? So the first one was we showed us, hey, are we making money? Are we losing money? That was our profit or loss statement. Um, the next thing we looked at was the balance sheet of saying, hey, do we have money or do we not have money? And then the following, and then the last question is, where did the money go? Or in this situation, where did the money come from? We lost $41,000, right? go mark up on here. We lost $41,000. I didn't have $41,000 to lose. And so who financed that loss? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the net income. And the first place I always look is the shareholder distributions. Because a lot of times people say, well, I don't have any money. I made $50,000, but you took the $50,000 out. So that's where the money went. So we lost $41,000. And then this guy also took another $37,000. So we are looking for $45,000. Where did $45,000 come from? Now, this is a pretty easy example here because you can see we got $65,000 of PPP money. And so instead of finding where $45,000 came from, we still have another $20,000 that we need to find where that went. 
right? We lost $45,000 between distributions and net income. We got $65,000 of PPP. So where is this extra $20,000? Where did it go? And so if I'm looking here, I'm looking at the net change of my liabilities. And so we had $45,000 of liabilities at the end of the year. We now have almost 49,000, a net change of 3,000. And so instead of finding $20,000, we now need to find $23,000. Because if you look, our sales tax payable went up a little bit and our accounts payable went up a little bit. So we have a little bit more of the state's money or a little bit more of our vendor's money. We have $23,000 unaccounted for that we need to figure out where it is. And so if we go up here to our assets section, we take a look, we got $23,000 we need to find. Well, easy one, 20,000 of that is in our bank account, right? Our bank account about went up $20,000. Where's the remaining $3,000? Accounts receivable, it's out on the street, right? So we got 65,000 of PPP money, 45,000 of that went to our lofts that we had for the year and money that we took out personally. We got a little bit more money from our increase in sales tax payable and our increase in our accounts payable. That difference is either in our bank account or out on the street in accounts receivable. And so that's kind of where we go down through and we analyze not only how much money do we have, but where did it go? What was the change? Where did it come from? Where did it go to? So that is about all that I have, Chris. We kind of let them drink through the fire hose there and went through a lot <laughs> of stuff here. Um, I'm guessing that we have some questions here. So we'll just open it up and see what people want to go through. Yeah, we had, we answered a couple as we went. I just in there, people, if you have questions, chat, you know, entered in the chat real quick and we can um, ask Hunt if everybody is okay, which I find that kind of strange. Nobody out there has any questions. Now's your chance to ask. Yeah, anything, okay. So, can you show the formula? Can you show the formula for showing an increase in sales via percentage, please? I.e., going from a thirty-three parts margin to a fifty percent parts margin. Uh, who asked that, Tim? Yeah. Come on, Tim. You're gonna be. You're gonna make it difficult on me. So for this exercise here, Tim, I actually cheated, and so I didn't have any of those increase in sales come from my parts margin increase. All that was actually from labor productivity. And so we were at $500,000 in sales, which was 50% productivity, which means that if we're at 100% productivity, we would have been at a million dollars in sales. And so if we split the difference here, where I got to $750,000 in sales, it's going to 75% efficiency. And so we actually did two things there. So we were driving our productivity. We were also boosting our parts margin. So if I would have factored that in there, we probably would have actually been over $750,000 in sales. But if you wanna see that one, we'll do that one real quick too. I know you're gonna make me do the hard math here. And so let's take a $100 part. So if a $100 part and we're at 50% gross profit, means we will sell that part for $200, right? So it's essentially double it. If we are at 33% gross profit, I have to do the math on here. So for a $100 part, but 33% gross profit, We're actually selling that part for $151. That's about, where that's about where we were before and where we were going to. And so strictly by increasing our parts gross profit margin, instead of selling that same $100 part for $150, we're now selling that same part for $200. $50 increase, right? And I mean, this one's gonna be directly related to the customers, which is why you know the parts gross profit side of things is a little bit trickier to do because obviously it's a pricing increase, but. That's where the math comes from. Cool. Okay, so I got 
I got another one from Doug here. It says, is the partner distribution money taxed? The partner distribution money is not taxed. And so when you're an S corporation or really any sort of things that takes distributions, you're taxed on net income, not your distributions. So if you make $100,000 in profit, whether that $100,000 is in your business bank account or whether you take it out personally, you're only going to pay tax on $100,000 one time. Okay. And then I've got another one for John, but I asked him, oh, hang on. Um, a follow-up question because I wasn't quite clear. It said, don't you have to increase marketing and taxes that are in expenses for this calculation? But I'm not sure which example he was referencing. So John, if you can give us a little more information on that one. So I think that what he was talking <clears throat> about there was, well, two things. So the marketing side of that, and I probably left this piece out. And so if we have a productivity issue, what we need to do is we need to figure out is where, what is the roadblock here? Why are we not driving more in sales? Do we have a productivity issue because we don't have cars coming through the door or do we have more work than we know what to do with and we can't get them out the door? For this specific example, John, this guy has more work than he knows what to do with, which is why he doesn't do any advertising. He has enough cars to get the 75% efficiency if he can just get the work out the door. But you're exactly right. If you're looking at this and this is your example and you're saying I'm at 50% productivity, but I don't have the work to get there anymore, then yes, you're going to have to drive your advertising dollars in order to you know, hit the desired result as far as productivity goes. Um, on the taxes side of things, you know, income taxes aren't tracked on this. Um, and so that would really not go into the equation, but I get what you mean on there. Oh, oh, John, John was asking, he said car count has to go up, correct? And, and the answer is not necessarily, John, you can do, if you have a low average repair order, and a low estimate, you can increase sales by 200, 250, $300,000 without getting an, another car in that you can just do that in doing a better job with estimates and selling and charging correctly. Yeah, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, Honestly, a lot of the shops that I work with, you know, I, I have some people that have a car count issue, but more likely than not, a lot of these guys have productivity issues. They have more work than they know what to do with. They just can't seem to get the work out the door and get this stuff sold. Yeah, and a lot of them, one of the big numbers that, that we talk about is the average estimate. A lot of people worry about average repair order and other stuff like that. But if your average estimate is $500 and your average repair order goal is $700, guess what? You're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. So we have to watch one in order to get to the other. So yeah. you can, that's, that's another reason why one of the things that we do is we look at your car count and see, you know, where we can go from there. 95% of our clients, when they come in, don't need more cars. They just need a better, more efficient process and to charge correctly. Yep. So yep. somebody else put, somebody else put in here, I believe in cash basis accounting, um, don't have, don't spend, but I know accrual is what everyone most believes in. Can you point me to a simple explanation why accrual trumps, quote unquote, um, intended cash accounting? Um, so the reason that we like accrual basis versus cash accounting is because it's going to be a mm -hmm. lot more accurate. And so accrual accounting means whether or not a customer pays us, that labor or that job is going to be booked when it was done. In the same flip side of things, it doesn't matter when I pay my parts vendor, that needs to be reflective in the same period that the work was done so that it's matching up. And so if you're looking at parts and you're looking at, or if you're looking at sales and you're looking at expenses, if you pay something this month, it might be in this month, but if the customer doesn't pay you, it's gonna be in the next month it's not going to line up because we're going to have no sales. We're going to have a bunch of costs. And then this following month, we're going to have a bunch of sales and no cost. What the accrual basis here is doing is it's matching these things up and it's making sure that the sales and the cost of goods sold or the expenses are all in the same period. I know what people talk about, like, hey, if I don't have money in the bank, I don't want to count it. I don't want to pay tax on that. That's fine. You can still do your taxes on cash basis, but 99 times out of 100, it actually still makes sense to do this on a cruel basis for tax purposes, and it'll also give you more accurate financials as well. well I got another question. Um, uh, on this P&L, the pay and benefits were in the, were in the expenses. Are they not COGS? 
So this person, like I said, there's a couple schools of thoughts for his specific example. He actually looked at some of the um, benefits. That's just his health insurance. He looks at that as a fixed expense because his logic is that's what he chooses to do with his profit. Um, no, Tim, I'm with you. When I'm looking at stuff, I want all of the pay and expenses allocated to the proper you know, labor categories, whether it's tech or service advisor. Um, yeah, this one is a little bit tweaked on that aspect of things. And um, I guess this one's for me and you can time in, chime in if you want to. Uh, Angie asks, what's the best way to determine if our labor rates on par also same for parts matrix? So, so the best way to not determine your labor rate is to call your neighbors and <laughs> um, average it out and go in the middle of all your neighbors because your expenses are not your neighbor's expenses and everybody else's. So first thing you wanna do is take your, your technician's tax and benefit load and make sure you have that and then figure out what your labor rate is. Now, we shoot for a little bit better labor margin than most. So if what I want you to do is take your tax and benefit load and the technician pay and multiply that times 3.5, which gets you in the 71% range. That's what I think your labor rate should be or something close to that. Um, but the, but the best way to determine if your labor rates on par and your parts matrix is, is to check your income statement and, and just do the quick math like um, uh, Hunt did to see, to see what your percentages are. And the other thing is, is if Angie, if you wanna email me or call me or set up an appointment, we can talk on the phone real quick and we can look at it together and, and I can tell you what my thoughts are. So you're saying on there, so if we have a tech pay, so if our loaded hourly rate on there for that technician is 30 bucks an hour, we multiply it times 3.5 and our labor rate should be 105. Yeah, and then so, and so here's the other thing. I would all, also always tell you, if you're gonna be 105, you might as well be 109 and some change. <laughs> and that gets us, because well, really, because we're trying to get to we're trying to get to, I'm trying to get you to 75 percent. So if you if you really look the math, 3.5 is only a 71 percent multiplier. So uh -huh. I still got to get uh, I got to tweak I got to tweak you a little bit to get some more. So we're gonna we're gonna bump you up to the highest end of that, and then I also want you to use a labor matrix out of your point of sale system, and then of course you can get into effective labor rate and everything else off of that. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing that people could like, you know, go into is they're looking at this number here. Hey, it's 105. You know, Chris's shop, his labor rate's 105. My shop is 150. And they might look at me and they say, well, Hunt, your shop's too expensive. What they don't realize is Chris is running some crazy labor matrix on it. And everyone is actually paying more like $200 an hour once you factor in, you know, the amount of time and stuff he's adding on to this. And so, yeah, it's... There's a lot of different ways to slice it. You know, the biggest thing I'll say on labor rate is, you know, like Chris says, hey, don't, you know, you obviously need to be in the same stratosphere as other people. You can't just be like, hey, I'm gonna be 200. Everyone else is doing this at 80. Um, but, you know, making sure that we're increasing that every year. That's the biggest thing that I see is people will be stuck at 105. They'll go through and they'll calculate this one time and then they just leave it at 105. Um, you know, increase this. And then also at the end of the day, stretch that. If you think you're comfortable with 105, just like what Chris says, go to 110. You know, you're usually the biggest hindrance of increasing your prices because you think that everyone's going to leave and everyone's going to run away. Um, you know, in actuality, if you're averaging two hours a ticket, a $5 increase, you know, in your labor rate is going to affect, going to affect your customers $10. You're more than likely not going to lose a sale over $10 here. And people are way more parts price conscious than they are labor right, labor conscious. Um, I, Tim may want to chime in here. I, off the top of my head, I don't think we have any, we, I don't think we have a client nationally that's less than 120 an hour. I might be incorrect, but not by much. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a couple. Okay. But in we're the 97, I mean, 99, 102 range. Okay. So what's the, what's the average about, uh, I think 115, 120 is usually probably about what we see is kind of the middle of the road. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that that's, I would say the 115, 120 is kind of high actually. But you think? so the other thing that as far as people that haven't figured it based off their expenses and things like that, and they've just, you know, have a labor rate. The other thing I'll tell you is regionally, there's a huge difference. Like if you go in the Pacific Northwest and a tech with tax and benefits is going to cost you maybe $60 an hour flat rate. 
uh, and you may even have to guarantee that guy to work. And then, you know, I can get the same guy in Arkansas or Mississippi, Alabama for 20 bucks an hour loaded. So it's, it's going to depend on that and, and what you're doing as well. Um, I got another one here. It says, is there a report that will show the PL info and include the members draw? That way we can really see where all the money went. I have trouble getting a report that shows everything on one report, or am I just stuck looking at a balance sheet and a PL? Yeah. And so Technically, there's no way to look at that. I'm not sure who asked that question. Technically, there's no way to look at this because this is our this is our profit and loss statement here. And you can see we have our bottom line and that's not factoring how much money that we've taken out of there. What I have some people that do is what they will do here is they'll add like another expense categories and call that draws and add in the $10,000 of draws or whatever it might be. And then down here, they'll kind of back that out. And so you can see overall the net effect is going to zero out to nothing, but it'll still be reflective in your net income and you'll be able to track it. That's the only really way to do it. Um, I don't like doing it because if your account's not on the same page as you, you might end up deducting that stuff. It kind of gets overly complicated. Um, yeah. And there's another one that says the estimate has to have a sweet spot or people will be overestimated and not do anything. I'm going to agree, I'm going to agree to disagree on this one. Um, you should be conscious of what you're you're estimating, but you also how do you determine what to include and what not to include? If if the car needs things and has things that are broken, shouldn't you um, estimate it all to your customer and let them make the decision? Um, I think you get into sticky situations where if you don't tell somebody something because you're afraid to write a correct estimate, you'll lose that customer that way and I don't know, sticky, sticky. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing on that one, Chris, is, hey, you can find, you can write up everything, but then, you know, get on their level and see what their, you know, intentions are for this vehicle. Like, hey, here's all the stuff that it needs. You know, Chris, what are you going to be doing with this car? You have attachment to it. You want to keep this going because when you get that information, then you can go down the list and say, hey, you know what? If you're going to get rid of this thing, you know, in the next year, let's do this, this, and this. But if you're going to keep this forever, then yeah, do the whole laundry list on it. Well, and yeah, so somebody, he said, some texts go kind of overboard. And then somebody said exactly what I was going to say is that then it's an internal problem. So, so my follow-up to that would be, is what is your DVI process? Um, who's checking the technician? And is that a technician that you want working in your business? Um, and it kind of, it depends on what overboard means. I mean, if you, if you do a DVI and you can show a picture and video of it and it needs it, then I don't think that's overboard. Um, you know, we're, our customers, our car speaks a language, our customers speak a language and they don't speak the same language. So they depend on us to be the interpreter and tell them what their car's needs are. And that, or that's, that's my, my feeling. Um, so it looks like we're to the end of the questions. We're a little bit over on time here. Um, a thank hunt uh, for, for joining in and going through this. It looks, some people are like, hey, the PRL information was, uh, was you know, basic, which that's what we did, but I really got something out of the balance sheet. So, um, you know, I, like I said, I think there was a little bit of something in here for everybody. Um, Hunt, do you have anything you wanna say before we close this out? Um, no, I mean, the biggest overall thing here is, you know, if your financials look like the first example where they're all messed up, they're all, you know, out of order, then don't get mad at yourself for you not understanding this. You know, you need to make sure that you give yourself, you know, a fair shake at being able to understand this and set these things up so that, you know, it's a useful management tool for you to use for your business. Awesome. So again, I want to thank Hunt. Um, we're, we're going to do one of these once a month. It won't be with Hunt every time, but we've got one set up and everybody that's on this, uh, that, that registered for this meeting will get the uh, invite for the marketing 2021 video or webinar. We're going to do, um, I believe we have that scheduled for February 25th. Um, the marketing and everything will be going out that going out for that soon. Um, yes, we recorded this as long as everything went fine in Zoom's cloud. And whenever we get that, whenever we get this closed out and they get it uploaded, we'll go through and everybody that registered for the event 
we'll get the, the Zoom link so you can go back in and watch it as many times as you want to. Um, again, thanks everybody for attending. I appreciate it very much. Thanks Hunt for um, taking time out of your day. I know you've got a little one at home that you're taking <laughs> care of and uh, appreciate that. And again, if you guys ever need anything, have any questions, comments, concerns, um, send me an email, send me uh, or give me a phone call, 580-491-3519 or chris at autofixsos.com, okay? Everybody have a great day and a great rest of your week and uh, close January out strong, all right? Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. See ya.